We're going to take a little shift in topics now, still water, but we're going to talk about the other huge reservoir of water, and that is the oceans and the problem of rising sea level. Jane Lubchenco, our next speaker, is a professor at Oregon State University. She's had an illustrious career as a marine ecologist and environmental scientist who has done research on many topics of biodiversity, sustainability, and the interactions between environment and human well-being. I'm, we're running a little late, so I'm going to cut the introduction a little short to, so we have more time to hear what Jane has to say. But I have to mention that she was asked to and, and agreed to join President Obama's science team in 2008. And she led the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration from 2009 to 2013, which was a challenging time in addition to all the uh, uh, duties normally in that position. That was the time of the um, Deepwater Horizon ecological crisis. And of course, that was not anything she was planning on, I think, when she <clears throat> took that job. Uh, NOAA, as you know, is one of the uh, federal agencies that collects high quality data, much of that data relevant to sea level rise. So I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing uh, Professor Lubchenko talk about sea level rise. Morning, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Dan. Uh, and thank you very much, Peter uh, and Jack, for the opportunity to be here, uh, listen to these amazing presentations, and share some thoughts with you. Um, Forty percent of the world's population lives in coastal areas. And so it is indeed appropriate that we focus our attention on one of the most obvious and perhaps insidious impacts of climate change, specifically sea level rise. That, in fact, is my topic today. Uh, in fact, I would uh, suggest that sea level rise is the poster child for climate change to many people. It's been a topic that has been on many radar screens. It's something that is obvious to many people. And as time passes and we are putting more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, changing the climate more and more, we are seeing uh, increasing uh, sea level rise that is bringing very obvious problems to many people around the world. My remarks are going to focus on these three very basic questions. What do we know about sea level rise? Why does it matter? Who should care? And what might be done? So let's dive in. I want to, thank you, Peter. <laughs> I want to start with sort of a broader focus uh, on the ocean, uh, in part because many of the talks have focused on the places where people live and work and play, which is primarily on land. Uh, and I want to remind us that 70% uh, of the surface area of the Earth and about 95 to 96% of the habitable, of the, of the place where critters live on the planet is in the ocean. The ocean, in fact, provides something vitally important to all of us. It's not just the water that's out there, but in fact, it provides uh, food for people. Our discussion about food security this morning really focused on land and a little bit about, uh, mostly plants, a little bit about livestock. But I would remind you that three billion people depend on seafood for a primary source of their protein. And so in addition to the conversations that we had this morning about how do we grow more food, how do we use it more efficiently, how do we get it where it needs to go uh, in a climate-changed world with a growing population. We need to also think about seafood, both wild capture seafood and uh, aquaculture as part of food security. There are very rich conversations around those topics, and we can return to that if anyone is interested. Another thing that the ocean does for each of you, in addition to providing seafood, if you are a seafood lover like I am, another thing that the ocean does is to provide half 
of the oxygen that you breathe. Every other breath you take, that oxygen came from the ocean, from the microscopic plants in the ocean that are spread over that surface area and in fact are doing something that benefits us directly. So this is part of the idea that the ocean is a key part of our life support system. But the ocean does a heck of a lot more than that. It also is a key part of the climate regulation system. The ocean is absorbing heat. The ocean is absorbing some of that excess carbon dioxide. And in doing so, it is actually keeping the rest of the planet from heating up as fast as it might have if the ocean weren't doing its job. So the ocean plays a key role in regulating climate. Now that has a downside because as the ocean gets warmer, that's a problem for a lot of the plants and animals and microbes that live in the ocean. As the ocean is absorbing a lot of that excess carbon dioxide, that makes the ocean more acidic. And the ocean is now 30% uh, more acidic than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The chemical changes that happen when the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide that make it more acidic are very real, not hypothetical. We've measured this, and it's causing a lot of problems, especially for plants and animals in the ocean that have a shell or a skeleton that is made of calcium carbonate. So the skeletons of corals for coral reefs, or the shells of oysters, the shells of crabs or lobster are made of calcium carbonate. And it's more and more difficult for those critters to make those shells or skeletons when the ocean is more acidic. And those shells and skeletons erode more quickly in a more acidic ocean. So climate change is not just about warmer uh, temperatures on land and in the ocean. It's not just about the redistribution of water that we've been hearing about in this session. It's also about ocean acidification. And that topic has not gotten as much attention as it deserves. So I wanted to be sure and mention it. Some people have called ocean acidification osteoporosis of the sea. And I think that's probably a pretty good uh, way to think about it. So those are other challenges. And as we think about what are the options for dealing with this monster of climate change problem and dealing with it in ways that are equitable, we need to think not only about mitigating the temperature, uh, but also doing something that's not going to exacerbate the ocean acidification problem. Returning to the ocean now and what it does for us, it also provides what I've labeled here as coastal protection. Habitats along the coastal margins, whether they are mangroves in the tropical areas around the planet, coral reefs, uh, kelp forests, those habitats play a very key function in helping to absorb storm surge in the face of a hurricane, for example, or in the aftermath of a tsunami, uh, absorb some of that storm surge and protect the people that live or grow crops behind that. And as we remove those coastal ecosystems, mangroves, wetlands, as we convert them into other uses, we're losing that benefit of coastal protection. So the land and the sea are intimately interconnected. And sometimes we kind of ignore what's happening in the ocean, but in fact, it is critically important to us. Even uh, equally importantly, the ocean provides very important cultural and spiritual values. It, it, it is something that uh, is a treasure trove of life uh, that is particularly meaningful to many uh, native populations that live in coastal areas, 
but to anyone who cares about all of creation. It really is uh, an amazing diversity of life that is in ocean. And as we think about our roles as stewards of the planet, we need to think about the life in the ocean, not just the life on land. So just a reminder of the key role that the ocean plays in all of our lives and the interconnectedness of people and the ocean, of land and the ocean. And of course, water integrates all of that. The problem is that as we change the climate, as we overfish the oceans, as we pollute the water with either excess nutrients or plastics or toxins, we are changing the workings of ocean ecosystems, whether it's a mangrove forest or the open ocean or a coral reef or the deep sea. We're changing the workings of those systems and those are the systems that are providing us with the benefits that we want. And so there are direct connections between the benefits that we want from the ocean and that those benefits are being compromised by many of these different things that are uh, causing very obvious problems, in some cases less obvious in others. So this is sort of a, a, a big picture reminder that the ocean is important to us. We are changing it in ways that have very real consequences for people and for the rest of life on Earth. Narrowing down on climate change and ocean acidification for a moment, we are already seeing very dramatic changes in the ocean. Very simply put, the ocean today is warmer, it's stormier, we're seeing more storms and storm tracks are changing. It holds less oxygen. Warmer water holds less oxygen. Most of the critters in the ocean depend on oxygen. They have ways of uh, uh, taking oxygen out of water. And if there's less oxygen in the ocean, that can be a problem for them. We're also seeing the oceans become more acidic. I mentioned that already. And they are becoming higher. And that, in fact, is the subject that I was asked to focus on, sea level rise. Sea level rise is a very real phenomenon. Sea levels have changed through time, and we have pretty good indicators of those. But I think more to the point of what we're talking about now is that since 1900, global mean, global average sea level has risen seven to eight inches. Now, that's not the same every place. This is a global average, and there's a lot of variation, for sure. Uh, the other key point here is that the rate of sea level rise is increasing. And so since 1993, we've seen three inches of that seven to eight. So the rate of sea level rise is increasing, and that is a very significant problem. If we look to the future and ask what's possible, there are lots of uncertainties in that. And some of those uncertainties have to do with what we choose to do, what people choose to do to reduce carbon emissions. That provides some uncertainty. How fast we reduce carbon emissions makes a huge difference. But there are other uncertainties that play into the challenges of making these predictions. And one of those uncertainties is exactly how the climate change we've already set in motion <clears throat> is going to affect the polar ice caps, in particular uh, in Greenland and in the Antarctic. Massive amounts of water are stored as ice there. And if all of that melts, that's a really bad outcome. And you saw uh, Colin's photo of the consequences of that to the Mississippi. Uh, but we don't really know. We have their pretty good estimates about what is likely, but there are huge uncertainties in that. And so this is an area in which we know things are already getting 
pretty bad. They could be a lot worse, but we're not sure exactly how much worse. So this uh, bottom figure shows you the huge range in estimates of what might be the amount of sea level rise we would see by 2100. And it is as little as, as little as an additional foot, which would actually be a real problem. But it could be as much as four feet. And that could actually be pretty catastrophic for a lot of coastal communities. Especially remembering that 40 percent of the world's population lives in coastal areas. So this sea level rise has very real consequences for where people live, how people uh, behave, uh, what kind of crops they can grow, etc. Most of today's sea level rise is caused by climate change. We have melting uh, in Greenland in the Antarctic. Uh, we have, uh, so that sea level rise is actually due to two different things, primarily. One is that warmer water, the ocean is becoming warmer. Warmer water expands. It just takes up more space. So some of the sea level rise is because the ocean is, ex because it's getting warmer, it's expanding. The other primary driver is that there is melting of ice on land that is then flowing into the ocean. So we have more water, and the water that's there is taking up more space. So that's very simply put uh, what's underway. Local geography, local oceanography, local geophysics make this global uh, sea level rise play out differently from one place to another in the coastal margins. Some places experience greater than average sea level rise, and that's true in Charleston, South Carolina, it's true in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, for example. Other places, like part of my coast of Oregon, are seeing uh, less than average sea level rise because the land is being uplifted. And so what you see on the uh, seashore, if you're looking out at it, is a combination of what's happening in the ocean and then what the land is doing, and the land is dynamic. And so, it, so you have to take all of that into account. And that's one of the reasons why you get variability from one place to another. But we have good information on the global average uh, patterns. In U.S. coastlines, um, they are a pretty small uh, fraction, these are coastal communities, uh, of the total land area of the U.S., less than 10%. But in the U.S., 40% of the population in the U.S. lives in coastal areas. And so this is uh, a, a real challenge for many of those folks. Uh, and the population of those counties is growing faster than populations inland. And so by the year 2020, for example, we're expecting an additional 10 million people in those coastal areas. <clears throat> These densely populated coastal areas um, are at risk, uh, and it is flooding, it's storm surge, and storm hazards, erosion, uh, are all some of the problems that it is causing. In many coastal U.S. locations, uh, especially on the eastern seaboard and in uh, places in the Gulf of Mexico, nuisance flooding is now routine. Uh, and it is 300 to 900% more frequent than it was 50 years ago. So this is uh, just a, a single example of how the rate of sea level rise is increasing. What are the impacts of that? It's just sea level rise coming up, but in fact it has huge consequences for those people in coastal areas. Elevated water levels can result, for example, not only in flooding, <clears throat> but also saltwater intrusion. That salt water from the ocean is penetrating into the water tables in coastal areas. And that presents huge problems for communities drinking water, for wildlife that lives in those areas that depends on the fresh water that used to be there, for coastal plant life, uh, for agriculture, 
you can't grow the same kind of crops in an area where you have salt water penetrating the water table. There are some crops that are more salt tolerant, but they're quite different from most of the crops that are grown in coastal areas now. And there are huge economic consequences for this salt water intrusion. There are many other consequences of sea level rise. I mentioned erosion before. And erosion is a very real problem for many communities. Uh, the, as sea level rise happens, uh, communities are increasingly losing land to the ocean. And this is most dramatic when you have uh, vertical cliffs and you can see the coast f uh, falling into the ocean. Another consequence uh, is that communities are more susceptible to storm surge as a result of sea level rise. Much of the incredible damage that was caused by Hurricane Sandy in New York City, for example, was uh, because the sea level was high, uh, then there was a lot more storm surge. So sea level rise is interacting with and exacerbating the kind of normal storm surge you might get from something like a really bad hurricane. And we saw that in spades with uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy. So storm surge, coastal erosion, saltwater intrusion, all of those are very real consequences of sea level rise. U.S. coastal flood risk is not only increasing, but it's on the rise. These are estimates from RMS, and this figure shows you for two cities that are at risk, Miami and New York, the chance that an event will cause at least $15 billion, B, billion, $15 billion in economic losses from storm surge in a given year is increasing quite dramatically. Uh, in uh, Miami, for example, uh, it goes from, actually I'm having trouble reading that from here. Can, what, what is the black one, Peter? Miami, uh, one in 125 now. So there's one in, one, one in 125 chances of a single event that will cause $15 billion. But by the year 2100, it is one in 30. Thank you, Peter. So the uh, increase of really bad, dramatic things happening is on the increase. So to just cut to the chase here, Sea level rise is already happening. It's already causing serious problems for a lot of coastal communities. It's getting worse. It might be really, really bad. We're not sure how bad. Uh, sea level rise is currently threatening coastal communities. It threatens health, drinking water, economies, infrastructure, especially port infrastructure. So many of the goods in our country come through the ports, and those ports, uh, their infrastructure is highly affected by sea level rise. Uh, it also affects national defense. So one of the areas of the U.S. coastline where sea level rise is happening the fastest is the Mid-Atlantic. The Navy has a major base in Norfolk, Virginia, and this is one of the reasons that the Navy is so focused on climate change and the Department of Defense is so focused on climate change because the Navy really gets it. Uh, and the threats to their infrastructure in coastal areas, not only in the US but around the world, um, are at serious risk because of sea level rise. So they get it, they're paying attention, and they think that it's one of the many reasons, sea level rise is one of the many reasons associated with climate change that the Department of Defense is taking this very seriously. A very key point here is that poor people, uh, poor nations, have, uh, are, are more vulnerable to all of these kinds of changes. They have fewer opportunities, they have fewer resources, they have fewer alternatives uh, to just buy bottled water instead of not drinking your tap water anymore. And so there are disproportionate, disproportionate consequences to poor people. And of course, uh, wildlife, for example, that depends on coastal habitats. 
So what can be done? Well, obviously, first and foremost, we need to reduce emissions. Uh, and that is pretty much uh, the name of the game that is critically important. But as we do so, there are other things that we can do to enhance uh, mitigation and adaptation to some of these changes that are already underway and to invest in the kind of not only scientific research but co-generated knowledge with communities, with businesses that can help provide solutions. One of the real problems uh, is that we're losing the very coastal habitats that can actually help us adapt to the sea level rise changes and the consequences thereof. We are uh, getting rid of coastal habitats. Many people think of mangroves as stinky, yucky places that might as well get rid of them. They're not good for anything. Uh, wetlands, same thing. Uh, but in fact, those habitats serve very real purposes that are critically important. And so more and more people are paying attention to opportunities to uh, reduce the rate of loss of those coastal uh, habitats, coastal wetlands, but also figure out better how to restore them. Many of those coastal habitats, whether they're oyster reefs underwater or mangroves or coral reefs as three uh, iconic coastal uh, communities, uh, each of those plays a key role in absorbing some of the storm surge in lessening the impact of hurricanes, for example. And in Louisiana, uh, I learned that folks talk about uh, barrier islands and uh, wetlands as, as speed bumps for hurricanes. They slow the hurricane down uh, and they absorb some of the power. These play a really key role in absorbing some of that power. The very same problem of loss of habitat and the very same opportunity of restoring them can also uh, result in more carbon being sequestered. Many of you have probably heard about carbon sequestration, how important forests are in carbon sequestration. People are now calling that green carbon. Whether it's uh, agricultural areas or forests, it's carbon sequestration that's being done by plants on land. There's now emerging talk about blue carbon, and that is carbon that is absorbed by plants in the ocean. So by um, either mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses are the three types of habitats that do most of the carbon sequestration in the ocean. That's blue carbon. And you can see the global distribution of those different habitats in this map. And looking at that map, you might think, that's not much area, probably not much opportunity to sequester carbon. But in fact, they are potent engines of grabbing that carbon and storing it and keeping it. This is a comparison of terrestrial on the left and coastal on the right, different types of habitats, the rate at which they are sequestering carbon. You see tropical forests, boreal forests, temperate forests. They're important, but they're nowhere near as important as mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrasses in terms of their potential per unit area to absorb carbon. So here is an incredible opportunity. Those habitats that we're losing are the ones that provide our buffers and can help soak up carbon and help with mitigation. So they can help with both adaptation as well as mitigation. In addition to that, those same habitats provide a wealth of other benefits to people. They provide places for recreation. They provide nursery areas for fisheries. They provide wonderful habitats for a lot of critters like birds. Bird watchers love to go to wetlands to look at the incredible birds that are migrating through or living there. So there are wonderful opportunities to think about how do we be smarter? How do we integrate this tool of protection and restoration into our toolbox as we think about 
uh, dealing with climate change. This gives you just some numbers about what some of the potential is, uh, how much carbon can be sequestered and how that would offset uh, use of coal uh, or barrels of oil uh, for different types of coastal wetlands. And the point is simply that this is an untapped opportunity that hasn't really been uh, focused on to the extent that it needs to. The wealth of other benefits that these habitats provide make it really, this is, this is a, a triple bottom line, really smart thing to do, and yet we're not doing it. We have fish that is coming, we have recreation, protection, jobs, habitats, and health are all wonderful benefits from restoring coastal habitats. When I was at NOAA, uh, when I began in 2009, uh, the economy was really in a free fall, and Congress passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to help provide some stimulus to jumpstart the economy. NOAA had $650 million to use to do coastal restoration projects as part of the Stimulus Act to uh, identify opportunities that were shovel ready, where we could restore a habitat, provide jobs for people who would do that coastal restoration, and at the same time bring some economic benefit in the long term because we were restoring habitats that were providing some of the functions that I just mentioned. We restored 25,000 acres of habitat, opened 677 miles of stream for fish, removed tons of debris from coastal habitats, and those coastal habitat restoration projects were just amazing, and they were in coastal areas all around the US. I told you that we had $650 million. We put out a request for proposals from communities around the US and said, give us your best ideas. Who's got a coastal restoration project? Tell us what you'd like to do, how much it would cost, how many jobs it would generate, what the long-term benefit would be. We got two, three uh, billion dollars worth of proposals within three weeks. We had $650 million to give away, and there were two, three billion dollars worth of proposals. We had a team that evaluated all those proposals, and I asked the team, of those $3 billion worth of proposals, how many of those were actually really good projects? And they said at least $2 billion worth of projects were no-brainers. The others might be, we just don't have enough information to evaluate that. So I share that anecdote because it really illustrates the untapped potential that we have to do community-based, smart habitat restoration in ways that could bring lots of benefits that in many cases would not solve the sea level rise problem, but help in terms of the mitigation and adaptation. The other thing that I would point out is that all of the agencies crunched their numbers about how many jobs are we creating and how much investment is causing different jobs. And this was a stunning outcome. We found that the projects that we funded per million dollars invested on average would create up to 30 jobs and that was more than twice as many jobs per million dollars as was being done with an investment in transportation and oil and gas combined. So these are the kinds of projects, transportation, building roads, bridges, fixing flawed infrastructure, those are the kinds of things that people tend to think of in Washington, D.C. about the go-to for job creation. But in fact, there's, again, an untapped potential here with coastal restoration. There's increased awareness, especially in coastal areas, about the importance of these problems and the opportunities. And there's an increased focus, especially by those communities that are constantly being flooded on high tides, uh, of, okay, what are we gonna do? And the city of Miami, the, the counties of Miami, Dade and Brower have done some real innovative thinking about what are they going to do? What do they need to prepare in terms of their infrastructure, uh, people's awareness, how are they gonna deal with saltwater intrusion, 
Uh, how are they going to do with, deal with property values, et cetera, drinking water, et cetera, et cetera. And I can tell you that many of the discussions tend to default to the hard structure solutions, armoring the coast, building barriers. And this is kind of the hard solution, the hard path that Peter was just referring to. There's a parallel focus not just on green, I mean on gray infrastructure, concrete, but on green infrastructure. And the smart thinking now is combining those two in a much more holistic way to think about how do we not just concrete everything to protect ourselves, but how do we work with nature? How do we have nature continue to help us as it has for millennia? but in this case, help us with a problem that we've created. And we do need help. And so thinking about the coastal restoration in combination with some physical infrastructure is the way people are doing it. And for example, when New York City, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, Mayor Bloomberg started thinking about, okay, what are the possibilities? He created a task force that investigated that, and they have a combination of gray and green infrastructure. Many of the communities along the Atlantic seaboard that were really seriously impacted by storm surge uh, during Hurricane Sandy uh, are now looking at coastal restoration opportunities to protect themselves uh, in the future. So there are a lot of uh, good ideas that are out there, but we are nowhere near sort of where we need to be. So what can be done? First and foremost, we have to accelerate the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. But secondly, I would suggest we also need to aggressively protect and restore natural habitats. We need to prepare for sea level rise, uh, and we need to do that in a more holistic way, thinking about green infrastructure and gray infrastructure, thinking about and involving communities in those discussions, but providing uh, the wherewithal taking special consideration for the people who are most vulnerable, who are most at risk uh, in these communities, uh, and investing in science to help us understand what some of the trade-offs are, what some of the solutions might be. Pope Francis has drawn attention, uh, and many of you have alluded to this, obviously, about these are actually moral issues, and we need to think about them in a moral context, uh, and that is as true of sea level rise as it is of any of the other topics that we focused on today. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. We'll look forward to questions.